Hi friends, my name is Benjamin, and today I want to tell you another chilling story. Molly Cecilia Tibbetts was born on May 8, 1998, in San Francisco, California, to parents Rob Tibbetts and Laura Tibbetts. When she was in second grade, her parents divorced, leading her to relocate to Iowa with her mother and two siblings. Despite the separation, her father maintained a close bond with the children. Molly resided in Brooklyn, Iowa, a small town approximately 70 miles east of Des Moines. She was pursuing a psychology degree at the University of Iowa. Additionally, she worked at a children's day camp at Grinnell Regional Medical Center and was gearing up for her sophomore year of college. On July 19, 2018, a Thursday, concerns arose when 20-year-old Molly Tibbetts failed to arrive for her summer job at a daycare center in Brooklyn, Iowa. Her absence was uncharacteristic, prompting her boyfriend, Dalton Jack, to attempt to reach her, only to find his calls unanswered, diverting to voicemail. None of Molly's family or friends had seen her that day, prompting Dalton to report her disappearance to the authorities. According to Dalton, the last contact he had with Molly was the previous night when she was alone at home. Molly had been staying at Dalton's residence, shared with his brother, Blake Jack, in Brooklyn, Iowa, as she was looking after their dogs. Molly was last seen on the evening of July 18th. During police inquiries, Dalton informed them that he and his brother were away for work that week, leaving Molly alone at the house. He stated that his last interaction with Molly was through a Snapchat message received at 10.30 p.m. on July 18th while he was in his hotel room watching a movie. Police initiated a search for Molly and learned that on July 18th, she went out for a jog along a rural road near Brooklyn. Christina Stewart, an acquaintance of Molly's, provided information to the police, stating that she spotted Molly running around 7.45 p.m. on that same day. Driving past her, Christina recognized Molly and was certain it was her. This prompted authorities to investigate surveillance footage in the vicinity, aiming to track Molly's route and subsequent movements. Over several weeks, a concerted effort involving hundreds of volunteers, friends, family, and law enforcement was launched to locate Molly, yet no traces of her were discovered. The case took a promising turn when police obtained CCTV footage capturing Molly during her run. The footage depicted passing vehicles, with one particular car catching attention for circling back and passing Molly once more. The individual identified by the police was Christian Bahina Rivera, an undocumented Mexican migrant who had been working under an alias at a nearby dairy farm called Yarabi Farms for a duration of four years. Surveillance footage from a homeowner's camera captured him driving past Molly in his Chevy Malibu. Christian was subsequently questioned regarding Molly's disappearance. Initially, Christian denied seeing Molly that day, but after extensive interrogation, he eventually confessed to encountering her. He admitted to seeing Molly while driving and circling back because he found her attractive. Further questioning shattered any hope of finding Molly alive. Christian disclosed that he exited his vehicle and approached Molly, who threatened to call the police if he didn't leave her alone. This provoked his anger, leading to a blackout. Upon regaining consciousness, he found himself inside his vehicle with Molly also inside, deceased and covered in blood. He then confessed to driving to a cornfield in Brooklyn, where he buried her body. Christian guided the police to the location where Molly was buried, where they discovered her distinctive running shoes amidst leaves and corn stalks. An autopsy later revealed that Molly had sustained multiple stab wounds. Christian faced a charge of first-degree murder, yet despite guiding the police to the burial site of Molly's body, he entered a plea of not guilty. Consequently, the prosecution aimed to persuade the jury that although Christian claimed to have blacked out after Molly threatened to call the police and discovered her covered in blood in his vehicle, the only plausible explanation for this gap in his confession was that he committed the act of stabbing her to death. The prosecution presented the argument that Christian and Christian alone was accountable for Molly's demise, asserting that no one else was involved in the crime. The jury was informed that the prosecution's case would pivot on three primary points to substantiate their argument. First, 
surveillance footage capturing Christian's truck passing by Molly while she was jogging. Second, specific statements Christian made to the police, coupled with his role in leading them to the location where Molly's body was interred. Third, the presence of Molly's DNA inside his truck, further implicating him in the crime. Powshik County attorney asserted to the court, when you put this evidence together, there can be no other conclusion than that the defendant killed Molly Tibbetts. The court was informed that Molly went out for a run on the evening of July 18th and never returned home. Instead, her badly decomposed body was discovered a month after she was reported missing. During the trial, Molly's boyfriend, Dalton Jack, provided testimony. He expressed his heartbreak over her death and described Molly as a cheerful, lively, and silly young woman who frequently went for runs. Dalton testified that they had been in a relationship for three years and recounted that on the day Molly disappeared, he was away for work. He stated that he was part of a crew constructing a bridge in Dubuque, approximately 140 miles from Brooklyn. According to Dalton's testimony, he worked a 12-hour shift on the day Molly was last seen alive, then socialized with the crew, drinking beer and playing yard games. He clarified that he did not return to Brooklyn that night, but instead stayed in a hotel. During the trial, the prosecution informed the court that upon Christian's arrest, he confessed to the police that he drove past Molly and, finding her attractive, circled back to approach her. He admitted to running alongside her, but when Molly threatened to involve the police, his anger escalated, leading to a confrontation and subsequent blackout. His next recollection was driving with Molly's bloodied body in his truck. According to court testimony, Christian then transported Molly to a cornfield, where he carried her to the burial site, covering her with stalks from the field. The prosecution asserted to the jury their belief that a sexual motive was involved in Molly's death, noting her attire of only socks and a sports bra, with her legs spread when her body was discovered in the cornfield. The jury was briefed on Molly's injuries, with the autopsy revealing she had suffered between seven to twelve stab wounds to her chest, ribs, neck, and skull, ultimately succumbing to sharp force injuries. The prosecution presented additional evidence to the court, highlighting Molly's DNA discovered in Christian's truck, particularly on blood spots found on the rubber trunk seal and trunk liner of his Malibu. Emphasizing the totality of the evidence, the prosecution urged the jury to consider it comprehensively, asserting that it would leave no room for doubt regarding Christian's guilt. In contrast, the defense offered a different perspective. They argued that Christian was not responsible for Molly's stabbing, describing him as a hard-working immigrant who entered the country illegally as a teenager in pursuit of a better life. His attorney, Jennifer Freeze, emphasized that the police prematurely concluded the investigation into Molly's case. Freeze underscored that while Molly's family deserved justice, so did Christian Bahina Rivera. The defense alleged that Christian was pressured into making a false confession. She described her client as a yes man and said that he always did anything he was asked to do. She told the jury that when police questioned him, it took place over the course of hours and hours and after he had just worked a 12-hour shift. She told the jury that his confession was false and coerced. The confrontation continued until it was put in my client's head. Perhaps you blacked out. The state in this case, they got what they wanted, and they closed the case. They got what they needed. There was an intense amount of pressure to close this case, to arrest someone for this vicious crime. The defense contended that Christian never confessed to stabbing Molly and suggested the involvement of another party. They sought to raise suspicions about Dalton, portraying him as an imperfect boyfriend with a short temper. Dalton admitted during his testimony that he had a tendency to lose his temper and engage in past fights. Additionally, the defense asserted that Dalton wasn't a faithful boyfriend, as he admitted to making a mistake and cheating on Molly. Dalton confirmed that Molly discovered his infidelity by going through messages on his phone. Although Dalton claimed they had moved past the issue, further questioning by the defense revealed that just three days before Molly disappeared, she was still upset about it. The day before she was last seen alive, she discussed the matter again. 
The defense also presented Dalton's phone records, indicating that he only called Molly once in the days following her disappearance, despite her body not being discovered until a month later. The defense informed the jury about an unusual text message Dalton received from a woman with whom he had a prior relationship. This message came after Molly was reported missing, amidst a large-scale search effort. It asked, Dalton, is Molly alive? Dalton acknowledged his faults and lack of honesty. He admitted to initially misleading the police by claiming he was watching a movie in his hotel room on the night Molly disappeared. He also confirmed that he initially told police his last communication with Molly was a Snapchat received at 10.30 p.m., when in reality he received it after 1 a.m. However, he denied any involvement in Molly's death. Christian took the stand and explained to the court that his initial statements to the police were not truthful because he feared for the safety of his former partner and child. He asserted that he was not responsible for Molly's death and implicated two other individuals. According to Christian's testimony on July 18th, while he was showering, two masked men he did not recognize broke into his trailer. One brandished a knife, the other a gun. They coerced him into driving to a rural road near Brooklyn, where Molly was. Christian claimed that one of the men killed Molly and placed her body in his vehicle, directing him where to dispose of it. He stated that they then threatened him, warning that harm would come to his former girlfriend and daughter if he spoke out. This, he explained, was why he initially told police he approached Molly and blacked out rather than revealing the truth. The defense brought forensic consultant Michael Spence to testify about the DNA discovered in Christian's truck. While he confirmed that Molly's DNA was present on bloodstains in the truck, he also stated that other DNA was found, including that of at least one unidentified male and female. Iris Gamboa, the mother of Christian's daughter, testified that she had lived with him for four years until their relationship ended in 2017. Despite their separation, she described Christian as a good father. She mentioned that he consistently paid $500 in child support for their daughter each month and also sent money to his parents in Mexico to support them in building a new house. When asked about Christian's behavior towards her, Iris stated that he was never violent and never exhibited excessive anger. Following seven hours of deliberation, the jury found Christian guilty of first-degree murder. Before the sentencing hearing, the defense requested time to investigate two claims that emerged after the guilty verdict was rendered. The judge granted a delay to allow for this. Upon obtaining details related to the new information, the defense filed a motion seeking a new trial for Christian. It was revealed in court that the claim suggested evidence pointing to others being responsible for Molly's death, which had only come to light after the guilty verdict. According to two individuals, a man named Gavin Jones confessed to them that he was responsible for Molly's death. One of the individuals, inmates stated that Gavin disclosed his involvement to him while they were both incarcerated at the Keokuk County Jail. Inmate recounted Gavin's confession, stating that Gavin claimed to have stabbed Molly with another individual, dismembered her and wrapped her body in plastic. Upon police inquiry, Gavin denied any involvement. It was disclosed that he had been in a rehabilitation facility during the summer of 2018 and later resided in an assisted living facility under state supervision. The defense also informed the court about a woman who came forward claiming she was abducted at a Brooklyn gas station several weeks before Molly's disappearance. According to her account, a man at the gas station pointed a gun at his own head and made the statement, that Mexican shouldn't be in jail for killing Molly Tibbetts because I raped her and killed her. Based on this new information, the defense argued that the guilty verdict should be overturned as it was deemed unsafe and a new trial should be ordered. However, the judge disagreed with this argument. After reviewing the new evidence presented a month after delaying the sentencing hearing, he concluded that it was unreliable. Furthermore, he found no compelling reason to overturn the verdict. The judge pointed out discrepancies between the alleged statement attributed to Gavin and the actual evidence presented in the case, noting that Molly had not been dismembered or wrapped in plastic. Additionally, 
the judge highlighted that many of the new allegations conflicted with the defense's own case and the evidence they presented during the trial. Their motion was denied, and judge informed them that he would proceed with sentencing Christian. Directing his words to Christian in court, judge remarked, You and you alone forever change the lives of those who loved Molly Tibbetts. Given that Iowa does not have the death penalty, Christian, having been found guilty of first-degree murder, received a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Additionally, the punishment included an order for Christian to pay $150,000 in restitution to the Tibbetts family. Molly's mother, Laura Calderwood, delivered a victim impact statement addressed to Christian, which was read to the court. I come here to give a voice to our daughter, granddaughter, sister, girlfriend, niece, cousin, and friend, Molly Cecilia Tibbetts. Molly was a young woman who simply wanted to go for a quiet run on the evening of the 18th of July, and you chose to violently and sadistically end that life. Because of your act, Molly's father, Rob, will never get to walk his only daughter down the aisle. Because of your act, Mr. Rivera, I will never get to see my daughter become a mother. The statement described Laura's difficulty in breaking the tragic news of Molly's murder to her own mother, Judy Calderwood, particularly given Judy's deep faith and unwavering belief that Molly would be found alive. Laura recounted the moment, saying, I very quietly and softly said, Mom, I have some bad news. They found Molly's body this morning. Judy Calderwood's unwavering faith had been brutally shattered by your senseless act of violence. The prosecutor in the case expressed his belief that the jury made the correct decision with the verdict and that the sentence imposed was appropriate, stating, Based upon the facts and circumstances of this case, it is very well deserved. What do you think of today's story? Write your opinion about this case in the comments. I thank you for your attention and recommend subscribing to the channel as well as clicking on the bell to not miss new videos that are released daily. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. See you soon.